So whether or not you think that was corny, I personally love it. And part of why I wanted to show that video and start off with it is because it's just so amazing how something so human, it's not up there anymore, um, can be surfaced through technology. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're currently interaction designers at IDEO. I'm Sarah. And I'm Marco. Actually, it was supposed to be David, but we have Marco here instead today. Um, we, switch, we switched Italians. Yeah, they're both Italians, so we're just replacing. <laughs> um, and often, we're actually asked pretty, free, pretty frequently, you know, what do you guys exactly do over there? Um, so this is us at the New York studio. We're kind of a weird bunch. Um, and we're also really interdisciplinary. So what that means is we have a lot of different types of people, um, a lot of different types of designers, and we really value that. And in all seriousness, uh, we do several things. We work across different industries um, and sectors, and we love doing that because it kind of opens our eyes and helps us sort of like connect the dots across the different things of what's happening and bring it back together. Um, we design different kinds of products, services, organizations. We solve problems through design thinking. We really love learning by doing and failing. Um, and most important of all, it's really central to our work. Um, we're really inspired by real people. What this boils down to is that at the end of the day, um, because we start with people and because we really believe in talking to and working with and designing for real people, um, we're often in a ton of conversations throughout our entire design process, whether that's from the design research to the designs we put in front of people, um, even in the way that we prototype. And recently, um, part of why we're here is because we've noticed our own growing interest in the way that we prototype and what we're prototyping. And we've been actually prototyping a ton of conversations, and we'll get more into that later. Um, and it's made us step back and think, you know, why is, this, why is this so important to us? And what exactly is a conversation? And what does it mean for us designers and geeks? So a conversation can be something uh, very different, can take many forms, uh, many formats, uh, lens, uh, from a tiny ping to um, a formal discussion to an interview. Uh, to something uh, more um, informal and, and relaxed. Um, but that said, um, a good conversation always have um, some sort of guidelines or principles um, that are uh, valid regardless uh, uh, of which kind of conversation we're talking about. Um, the first thing is like uh, the things or the people that are involved in the conversation um, have some goals. Um, and they, are, may, they may be explicit or implicit, but there are some definitely, definitely always some goals in mind. Um, also, a good conversation, uh, and to, to create a good conversation, if you want to be conversational, uh, you have to take into account the context where the conversation is taking place. Uh, it can be like the physical context, but also like the cultural context that, that's, uh, that's uh, involved. Um, and at the end of the day, um, there is, an agreed exchange uh, or transaction that conversation. Um, and all of these things uh, together, they led up to an exchange, but especially most of the time a creation of value uh, between the people that are involved into the conversation. But um, nowadays, uh, with, uh, with the kind of technologies that we have uh, around us and the kind of um, noise that is around conversation, uh, it can be tricky and very complex and convoluted to have a, a, a decent conversation in place. Um, there are several different technologies that can allow us to have a conversation uh, from social networks. Uh, there's a variety for, to choose from, from the old good Facebook uh, to the millennial Snapchat. Um, and all of them tend to provide us with these tiny snippets uh, of conversations that in, are embodied into notifications, uh, which most of the time can be like, really annoying and, and useless. Um, and then you can even start to talk with your phone uh, and look like a crazy person, um, or get into more like ambient and discreet uh, form of communicating, 
um, they are based on uh, your personal behaviors. Uh, but given all this, uh, still, uh, there's one way of conversation that we think is very, very useful. Yeah, so the flavor of the day, SMS. Um, the first SMS text was sent over, I think over 20 years ago in the early 90s. Um, and we personally think that it's still relevant as ever. Um, it's our personal favorite because it's so accessible to so many people across the board. Um, it's familiar, it's affordable, it's convenient, um, and it has a really low barrier for engagement. And that actually means a lot when you're trying to design um, for someone. And all of this together, put together, um, it just shows how the world is frankly really amazing. Um, but with everything at our fingertips, um, I think one thing we wanted to address today is why is it so important to go back to the basics of a conversation? So the first thing is we're always in a conversation um, with our environment, with our objects, um, with each other, and every interaction is um, defined by a conversation, whether or not that's explicit or you're aware of it. The second is that behind every interaction is actually an ask. Um, it's a question. It's potentially the beginning of a dialogue. And then with so much available to us, I think what's also happening right now is people are getting really fatigued by clutter and with that unnecessary solutions, right? Like unnecessary patterns even. And technology has made convenience so achievable that I think sometimes we kind of forget that familiar, familiarity and fluency can actually go a really long way. So one of my favorite shows actually really hit this on the nail really well. My last company was genius. You ever been lost in a parking lot before? Uh, yeah. See, what my app would do was use existing AVL technology, right? So you would just type in the VIN number, and if your car didn't have AVL capabilities, you would just type in, like, what section of the parking lot you were in, like P3 or Ground 7. It's, so you just, you, you just write down what section of the parking lot you're in? I mean, why do you need an app for that? So you can remember where you parked. Right. Uh, but why don't you just write it down on a piece of paper? Well, yeah, but this is for your phone. Okay. So it's, it's just sort of like, notepad? Exactly, <laughs> see? So I personally love notepad. I actually still use it all the time. Um, but another thing that I loved way back when is um, Google's SMS search. Um, so I used to use it to kind of ping for little bits of information. Um, and Google created it to do just that. It would let users um, search things um, through text to a short number, and then they would get text back. Um, and you could ask for local listings, um, you could ask for um, the weather, currency conversions, things like that. Um, and what I loved about it was that it, to me actually, it felt like the hallmark of a good conversation. So there was two people or objects or things involved, me and whatever was behind the system. Um, there was the thing that I was trying to get and that it was trying to align that with me. Um, there are ways in which I could kind of edit what I was asking to get to the right answer and be satisfied. Um, and then also, it understood context to, to a degree, right? Like it could take my zip code, it could take a couple keywords and understand what I was trying to ask for and hopefully sort of calibrate to that. And I think something that's relevant today is that um, and it kind of, the reason why we bring this up in that example is because there was something so beautiful about how efficient and simple that interaction was. Um, and today, more than ever, the reality is that someone's time is incredibly precious. Um, Paul Ford is one of my favorite people, writers, and he said something that's really stuck with me all this time. And it says, if we are going to ask people in the form of our products, in the form of the things we make, to spend their heartbeats, how can we be sure, far more sure than we are now, that they spend those heartbeats wisely? So as designers, we're, we have a couple, we see a couple opportunities for ourselves, for everyone. Um, one is how might we go beyond the interface um, to focus on re what really matters? So in this case, the content and the conversations at hand. And the second is, um, at its simplest, a conversation is an exchange of value, right? Between you, your users, um, and the things that you're designing. Um, so as designers, how might we set the stage and really choreograph those conversations, make it intentional, 
and so forth. So in the New York studio, um, the way uh, we found ourselves um, to answer these questions is to go um, old school, basically, um, and to use messages uh, to break down and prototype uh, conversations. Um, so there are, uh, for us, prototyping basically means uh, setting up a question. Um, it's an embodied question, and it's uh, a way to make that question tangible and sort of manageable and informative. Um, also, as a, a prototype, is also a conversation starter. Um, at IDEO, the earliest prototypes that we use, uh, we call them provocations, basically because they help us as designers um, to acquire knowledge uh, and evolve and iterate on the design very fast and understand like uh, what works and what doesn't. Um, with that said, um, SMS are one way that we use to prototype. Specifically, we use that uh, in two primary ways. Um, on one hand, um, it, it allows us to learn from people very fast. Um, and basically allows us to start having conversation, and allow us to, uh, and we see that more uh, later in the presentation, like understand what kind of tone we have to use, uh, what is appropriate, what is not, um, and is generally very, very informative. Um, on the other hand, um, prototype um, basically allow us to uh, make uh, the design into the real world without doing the real thing. Um, and having that uh, as a possibility allow us to go very fast and not spend too much time in thinking about what kind of technology has to support this, but basically hacking around and making things work in the fastest way possible. And ultimately, for us, the, the purpose of a prototype is to connect people with a real thing that isn't there yet. So the first project that we'll run through is um, the code name is Topiary. All of our projects actually have code names. Um, so you might see snippets of that throughout. Um, so it was an experiment on, around how to start a dialogue. And the context is that for the client, um, they wanted to rethink the physical space um, of their offices and really design a way to kind of engage people um, and inspire people to have more like serendipitous collisions, basically. And we designed several experiences around that, um, especially around providing unexpected pieces of information. And in this case, um, we built and placed in the kitchen of their space a digital tool that was pulling random news from different sources. So the New York Times, Bloomberg, even Mashable and BuzzFeed. Um, and displaying them side by side. And as part of this prototype, uh, we wanted people to really think about the underlying relationship between the news, um, to connect the dots via SMS, um, and then actually text in uh, what they were thinking. And this ultimately helped us to understand the drivers and types of triggers that inspire people to take action. And another thing I think that SMS played a great role in is that oftentimes it it really allows for um, safety. So there's kind of this like barrier between you and what you're, and whoever you're trying to connect with, and, and sometimes that barrier is actually a necessary barrier. Like if you're feeling too shy, or maybe you're, it's not your normal behavior to you know, be incredibly vocal, SMS kind of provides you a safer way of getting your thoughts heard. And then the second project, um, this one's actually pretty personal for me, um, was around how do you actually design um, companion, a, a companion experience through dialogue. Um, so Mira, I don't know if you know about it, but it was, um, it's an app and device experience for tracking fitness for women specifically. Um, and it was designed to help women stay motivated in her daily life. And we were really curious about the kind of dialogue that's um, successful for engaging with these women. Because um, a lot of the things that were out there um, would, weren't really resonating. Like they're just laying, saying things like, yay, you reached a goal. And for a lot of women, they were saying, that's not really all that important to me. Um, or they're talking about how a lot of the 
like the jawbones and fuel bands didn't feel like it was speaking to them in the way that they wanted to be spoken to. So we had a lot of questions around the right tone, um, the right amount of content, when and how you interact with them, and so forth. Um, we built out an SMS prototyping tool using things like Heroku and Twilio. Um, it had both the automated and manual capabilities. So automated meant you could have responses baked in depending on certain hashtags or certain keywords. Um, and then it, for us personally, it was a way for us to keep track of all the types of responses we were getting. Um, one of the interesting things that sort of S prototyping through SMS allowed us to understand is um, we were so focused on having a positive experience, but for some of these women, they actually wanted to capture the things that failed for them that day as well. So in this case, this woman is like, I had two Heath bars today, but that was just as important for her to capture as saying, I went for a walk. Um, so that was, that was in, an incredible moment for us, and it's what SMS prototyping allowed us to kind of discover on the fly. Um, so while we had that fancy back end, um, for the women we were prototyping with, um, the experience looked something more like this. So just a straightforward SMS thing. Um, and it, the way that we played with this was we actually, Echo was the name of the service at the time. Um, we assigned a tone and a personality to it. And so we literally had one of my coworkers literally, literally stood behind this woman as she was doing her workout and sending her text messages. Um, and this woman had no idea. She was convinced that it was this automated service. Um, there was one point in which we followed her to a gym and then Echo sent her a message and then she got really angry. She's like, I wanna throw Echo at the wall. And we're like, why? And she said, I think um, because it's like, he's pissing me off. And we're like, why do you think that it's a guy? And he's like, because he's pissing me off. So he's gonna be a guy. <laughs> Um, so just little things like that that you can kind of tweak on the fly um, or get at or probe at. Um, we could easily change the tone and see if that works or change, see if there's a different gender assigned to it and so forth. And so there's all these really delightful moments that come from, at least for us, from prototyping with SMS. Um, eventually the experience evolved to something like this and this is kind of a couple years back so it's probably really different from what it is now. Um, but Really for me, I think it was one of my favorite prototypes and um, research moments because it really helped us ground the experience in something real, um, in the right kind of conversation and tone that should be used in an experience like this. So even if it looks um, not like a conversation, there are moments for tone, right? So the way in which you give her encouragement, or the way in which she actually is able to make um, a note about what she was doing. So the, the kinds of um, things that you make available and the ways in which you talk to them, um, a lot of that was really informed by doing the prototyping. Um, the third project, um, so a couple years back, we actually worked with PMD. Um, they're a local startup here in New York. And we really were curious about how to facil facilitate through dialogue. So they were dealing with a situation where they wanted to simplify incredibly complex conversations between parents, doctors, and all sorts of health, pro health professionals who are involved in that conversation. Um, we started with an existing application, so it was proven to be successful um, because it was able to respond to a strong user need, but the user experience was what was lacking. Um, and it was broken, and it didn't really convey, like even looking at it here, it feels very just not accessible, right? It doesn't feel like you're talking to a doctor. It feels like you're talking to an interface. And so the team went into the field. Um, the type of work that we do, again, we've talked to a lot of people. Um, we sometimes just, like, we actually show up in their homes because that actually says a lot. Um, and we wanted to, you know, just understand how better to facilitate these conversations, what's required to make people feel like they can trust it, um, that they're getting the right kind of information, and so forth. Um, and this was really an experiment around the right kind of tone again. Um, how do you express empathy um, through an interface? Um, and then we came up with a design that um, actually in a lot of ways is 
basically SMS embedded into a digital experience. So the interaction itself is just texting back and forth if you really break it down to its simplest level. Um, but we were able to kind of then think, think around like what's the, how do you make it feel private? How do you make it feel safe um, in comparison to what they had previously? And then the fourth project, um, so Single Stop is an organization here in New York, um, and they, um, they're, they're really about trying to help people connect to public benefits and services. And earlier this year, we partnered with them to design a text-driven call center. And it was a call center that support, that's trying to support and arm people with the right kind of information to really help them navigate the system, because I think the system is broken. It's really heartbreaking at times. Um, it's difficult. Um, there's not. There's a lot of information almost out there, and you don't know which one to trust. Um, so we thought that a text-driven service was actually the best way to provide information across the board to a lot of different people. Um, and again, like every, we actually recruited a number of participants for this, um, for a prototype, two-week prototype that we did. And every single one of them was like, yeah, of course I have SMS, right? So that's easily one of the best ways to engage with people. Um, to do this, uh, we needed to start off with content. Um, we, there was four of us in the team. We were not social workers by any means. So we didn't really know the right answers, but we had to start somewhere. So we kind of thought through a couple of different scenarios that could happen. So people will ask around food. You know, where do they get food? How can they get food? Um, they might ask ar around like getting a job and so forth. And we kind of started out trying to play out these typical conversations and what they might be like. Um, and then as we were engaging with the recruits, um, we were, we kind of went super analog and was sort of keeping track of, you know, who we talked to, when we talked to them, if a case got closed or if they actually were able to access a benefit or a service. Um, and then similar to the Mira project, we also built a web-based um, SMS prototyping tool, again using Heroku and Tulio, um, that we used to directly text back and forth with these people. Um, and this was all real time. They were actually um, going to, let's say, the local HRA and trying to apply <coughs> for something. And we just told them, text us whenever you have questions or for any reason whatsoever during these two weeks, and we will try to help you however way we can. Um, it was really scary in some ways because, again, we weren't um, social workers, so it's not like we felt entirely equipped. Um, but we did our best, and oftentimes Google was actually your best friend. And even when we called 311, um, sometimes like the information you got wasn't, you know, the things you found on Google or the things we found was actually just enough information. Um, and then another interesting thing about this experiment was through texting, we were able to kind of identify a couple different ways in which people want to converse, converse with you if you're trying to be a support system. So the first was, you know, people have logistical quick hit questions. So similar to what Google SMS search was doing in the past. So if people are like, what time does this thing open? Where is it located? Um, the second one was if they're actually trying to figure something out and trying to actually get a benefit, then that's like a much more invested process. So either one of us would be assigned to a person and really walk them through and be on the other end. Um, whether that's like staying up till however late, just in case they ping you, or making sure that you know you're actually awake in the morning, um, and then the third one that was surprising for us was that people sometimes just want to talk to something, and they don't necessarily need a solution. They just want someone. They just want to know that they've been heard, and SMS was kind of this amazing way that they were able to um, fulfill that. Right, so again, the anonymity of SMS was actually brilliant in this situation um, because I think for any one of us, going to someone uh, in person and talking to them about very personal situations can be incredibly intimidating. So I think that's why you know, services like, you know, like Post Secret and things like that take off because there's kind of this layer of privacy and SMS is really great for that. So 
given all the different projects we showcased to tonight and uh, the different things we were talking about, um, we were starting actually to um, getting some principles, some guidelines uh, uh, that were across the board, uh, the different projects, some sort of patterns uh, that were across the board, the board, the different, uh, different projects. Um, if we were to share tonight, the first thing we want to say is like, start with a question. Um, as we were saying before, like uh, a prototype is basically a question. So um, try to understand what you are trying to learn. Uh, what is your goal? Um, uh, what um, are you? What, what what is the thing that you want really want to learn? What is like the most critical sometimes, or the most delightful thing uh, for your product that you want to put out, and why you want to learn that? Um, and the second thing is like who you are learning it from. Um, what are the users that you're going to ask those things? Um, and once you, have fi once you have that figured out, um, you can start to establish um, a set of parameters uh, that actually um, allows you to test your assumptions. Um, right, so um, I think one thing we want to stress is that it's not about getting it perfect. So even the work that we were doing with single stop where we started with the spreadsheet. It wasn't something that we're like, this is exactly the way it's gonna flow. Uh, we just created that as a way to start, but we knew quickly that it was probably gonna change and at the end of the day, it actually, we didn't even, we weren't even right at all. So that was a quick learning. Um, but it was great to start with the set of parameters because that kind of gets you going. And the other thing that was interesting about that one is um, we actually didn't need as much information as we thought to be able to successfully converse with someone through text. So in that case, you just needed to know their zip code, um, what age range they were in, and whether or not they had a family. And that could already tell you a ton of information about you know, where should they go to apply, um, you know, what kinds of services or benefits are they eligible for, and so forth. And then, um and this seems kind of obvious, but like um, the kind of content you are going to produce is going to define exactly what the conversation is going to be like. Um, I would uh, challenge you to try to do live prototyping, so just texting someone out of the blue, and try to keep a conversation if you didn't have like content prepared. Uh, it's either awkward or impossible or both. Um, and there's a lot, there are a lot of things that goes into that, like the tone of voice that you're going to use, the type of content, the when and the how you're going to uh, exchange content with the person, the frequency uh, and how and how that frequency like change during the day, for example, or the week, um, and other things like do you prefer something that's automated? Would do, do you prefer something that's manual? When each of those are appropriate? Sarah can talk a bit more about the single stop project and about that. Sure, so I think when we first started that project, we weren't sure the kind of tone that someone wanted to engage with. Was it supposed to be a friend? Is it supposed to be someone who's an expert? Um, is it someone that has been through it before, for example? Um, so we actually recreated each piece of content that we started with in every tone that we identified. Um, we actually had a writer on our team as well who was able to kind of um, massage that. Um, and then the way we prototype was that, depending on the person, sometimes we switched. So for one person, we're like, let's try this tone. And then another person, we're like, you know what? We might want to experiment with another tone and see how that works. Um, another way that we experimented with content was, because um, the reality of it, if you were to try to create a real SMS service is that it's not always going to be the same person on the other end. So for some people, we just assigned one person, and for other people, we actually switched between the four of us, but we kept the same identity of whatever the service is and tried to see if that actually disrupted anything. Um, didn't actually uh, disrupt it, um, it was fine. Um, I think the other thing that we learned from that was that people are pretty smart, they're capable, um, they're looking for something, and if you're able to fulfill that, that actually goes a really long way. Um, so we were incredibly worried for no reason in some ways, and that was a very humbling experience for me. From the technology perspective, sometimes uh, we might feel scared that we are not uh, equipped with uh, what we need to actually produce something, uh, and that's 
that's basically just a fear uh, that you need to uh, challenge as soon as possible. Um, there is no need to build the real thing uh, in the very beginning. It's actually like a, most of the time a waste of time. Uh, as Sarah was mentioning before, uh, we learn a ton in the very beginning of the project. Um, and there's no need to, to reinvent the wheel. If you need a database, uh, most likely a Google spreadsheet is going to be just fine. Right. And then, you know, even in the Mira project, we literally just texted them through our phones. And that was OK, too. Um, so there's, there's many different ways you can um, prototype this. And you don't really have to worry so much about building, again, building that real thing to make it work. Um, in our case, we've actually had a lot of success working with Heroku and Tolio and connecting it. Um, but if that's not available, then there's things like you can actually forward things to Google Voice and, and so forth, or again, just using your own SMS text message capability. And with all that time that you have not spent trying to build a real thing, you can iterate, iterate, and iterate. Um, and in conversations, iteration is extremely helpful and is in, and is in, uh, in real time and basically can allow you to pivot um, whatever like the topic is, the tone is, uh, the content is, um, and learn on the fly uh, how to build your, your product. And then most important of all, um, you don't want to lose sight of why you're prototyping, um, whatever it is that you're curious about. Um, so I think it's always good to remind ourselves, and it's true for us as well, um, who we're designing for and why. Um, and sometimes it's actually OK to go back to the things that worked well before. So whether that's like Notepad or SMS or um, whatever it is. And if there's nothing else that you get from this talk, um, one thing that we would love for you to think about is this question. And we think about it too, and I do all the time, is this idea around what's, what's the heartbeat of the conversations that you're ultimately designing for. Thank you.